Okay, um, it's a little bit about me, who I am, Matt Maddox. I'm on the support team. Um, there's my GitHub. Um, I do have a lot of slides and a lot of content, so I am going to try to hustle through these as, as quick as possible, just so we can get through it. Um, basically, what we're going to follow is we're going to go over some Kubernetes basic concepts, and then we're really going to just going to dive into troubleshooting and kind of go into the major components of Kubernetes, and then we're going to wrap it up with um, some high-level recommendations um, for Kubernetes clusters. Um, so long story short, Kubernetes is really built on three, three, three main areas. The etcd, aka the database, control plane, which manages Kubernetes and worker is where things work. <laughs> That's where your actual applications are work. And, and we're going to kind of follow this order um, because e starting from the top down, they all rely on the stuff above them. Um, I'm not going to go too much detail with this, um, just because it is kind of complicated. Uh, the, the main thing to take away from here is to, to know that the etcd and control plane nodes, that they do do a lot. Um, so don't skip on the size of them. Uh, worker nodes, there's actually very little that runs as far as Kubernetes is concerned on the worker plane. Uh, most of the Kubernetes stuff runs inside the etcd and control plane. Um, so the big thing with etcd is it is a database. It should be treated as, as if it was any other. The big thing is, is etcd is based on the quorum system. All nodes have to agree with each other. You always have to maintain quorum in your cluster. Hence why, and this is something I really want to point out, a two node cluster is actually worse than a, a single node cluster. Um, simply because if you lose any node in, in a two node, the whole cluster goes down. Um, etcd always takes the stance of safety of data first. Um, so when in doubt, it stops. And if it ever gets inconsistent, it just stops right away and we is write latency. etcd is extremely write latency um, sensitive. Uh, any kind of slowness in your disk, etcd is going to hurt. And because etcd is the basis of your cluster, if etcd is hurting, everything upstream is hurting too. Um, so I, I, I do encourage people to review this doc. Um, it it kind of goes a little bit more detail of, of some of the rec with etcd. Um, the other big one I, one I want to point out is three node etcd clusters are pretty standard across, across the industry. Um, we generally don't recommend going above five nodes, um, and three and five nodes are kind of the good butter zone to be in for most environments. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, the other big component is the Cube API server. Think of this as the orchestrator of your cluster. He's the guy that's making the decisions. He's the guy that is your single point of contact for the cluster. Um, this is what you're going to interact with most. Um, this is what keeps CTL. This is what almost everything in Kubernetes talks to. This is runs on your control plane, and it is active active. Um, so you can load balance across it. If one goes down, it immediately takes over. And the controller managers. Um, most mostly you're not going to deal with a lot of these unless you're dealing with some critical issue um, this is more around just how does kubernetes manage things like nodes and, and endpoints and, and keep its state up to date uh, that's handled by the controller managers um, that's how it knows what what nodes are part of it um, can agree on when to, to remove nodes and, and update node status you know uh, those kind of items and scheduler. Um, this is really the deploying pods. Um, you'll see this a lot of times. If this is unhappy, your cluster will look healthy, but no pods will start, and pods are going to get scheduled really weird and, and getting put on wrong nodes and stuff like that. It's usually an issue here. Um, and of course, we're going to go more in depth on how to actually troubleshoot these uh, later. Okay, so the 
high level troubleshooting. So the big thing, I, I always recommend customers, you, you know how to access your cluster, how to get into Docker, um, how to you know, SSH to your nodes, document those processes so that you know how to get there because Docker logs and kubectl logs are going to be your friend. Whenever you're troubleshooting issues, that's the first area that you're going to want to dive into. The other big one that I would know is almost all, if not all, uh, timestamps in Kubernetes world are in UTC. Um, everything's just standardized. Um, Kubernetes doesn't respect time zones on the server. It just does everything in UTC. Um, just makes it easier across the board. Um, I've seen this trip up people where they don't realize it's an ETC and it makes correlating things uh, a little bit difficult. Um, the other big thing, and this is how I always start my support calls, what changed? Um, were you doing patching? Were you doing infrastructure changes? You, the networking team upgrading the firewall and then suddenly Kubernetes. Um, always be asking your infrastructure teams if suddenly you start having a problem, did they change anything? Um, you know, a simple thing is migrating a VM to another ESXi host can cause a tr can trigger event in Kubernetes. So ask those questions. The other one is large deployments. Um, ask your app teams, did they just do a 500 pod deployment and suddenly Kubernetes is having issues? Um, and then the other Big one, and we see this more in like AWS and in a lot of cloud providers. Um, if you're spreading clusters across a region, such as like uh, US, you know, a ABC, um, if suddenly C starts having an issue, that could potentially affect the whole cluster. Um, so do some analysis there. You know, is, is AWS having an issue in one? Subregion, if so, let's let's move that out of there and slide around. Um, the other thing is to have in your environment, um, and we'll go a little bit deeper into what kind of metrics you should be tracking long term um, a little bit later. Um, fixes. Um, the the biggest one that is to have multiple environments that you can compare against. Uh, let's identical setup. If magically it doesn't work there, then we know, okay, well, what's causing it not to be re, you know, reproducible? Or if it is reproducible in lower environment, okay, let's start changing things one at a time in lower and, and work our way up. Um, the other big thing is to isolate issues. Um, one of the biggest things that I do is your readiness and liveliness probes. Um, if containers aren't starting for some reason, turn off your probes and see if they magically start. Um, if so, maybe your monitoring is broken and your application is not really broken or vice versa. Maybe your monitoring is working and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, the other thing is don't be don't be don't concern yourself with removing bad nodes. Um, it's okay. Hey Matthew, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, it seems like we're having some audio uh, issues at the moment. Would you be able to dial in from your phone to uh, resume with the present uh, presentation? Uh, yeah, let me try it one second. Okay, thank you. Is that better? So far, sounds good. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Okay. No um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's again, that's why we call our company Rancher, is because servers should be cattle. You should, you should not be concerned to ever get rid of a node if it needs to get rid of. Um, and then the other big thing is, 
to, to stay on top of known issues. Um, Kubernetes, of course, always has known issues. Um, and the, we're, we try our very best to, to implement fixes and workarounds uh, for things that are waiting on patching. Um, and then, uh, you know, back to my previous point, have a test environment that you can test things again. Um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of never rolling into production first. You know, even if it's a simple fix, roll it into your lower environment and let, you know, tr tr treat your Kubernetes like you would do any other application, roll it into dev, test, QA, and, and then into prod. Okay. And the other big one is root cause. Um, if something is happening in your environment, you should know what the cause is. Um, you know, don't be afraid to file bugs. Um, we, we really encourage it both on the Kubernetes and, and rancher side of the house. Um, if, if you're seeing an issue, you're seeing an error, open a bug against it and, and, and dig, dig into it to figure out what's going on. Because I guarantee you're not the only person that's got that issue. And if, if, if we're throwing an error, it, it means that something's broken somewhere and we need to fix it, even if it's a, a benign error. Um, okay, now to really dive into the actual stuff. Um, so the very first thing that I always run when looking at PD is the etcd member list command. Um, this simply, tell, it simply tells you what nodes are part of your etcd cluster. Um, as you see here, I have the classic three nodes. Um, the big thing that we're, we're looking at here is the started. This tells me that, okay, they're at least up and responding. Um, if one of these was, was failed or unavailable, or um, let's say I removed a node and it was still here, then that tells me I need to maybe look into that node and figure out what's going on. Because SCD thinks that that node's still there, that it's not really there. The other one is the endpoint. Um, so, and of course, all, all these commands and scripts will be provided at the, at the end of the call as well. Um, the endpoint status, this is a built-in health check to SCD. So even if SCD is up and running, it potentially could be in a bad state such as let's say somebody went in and corrupted the database or a disk failure happened. SCD might be up and responding, but it might have totally invalid data. Um, this will tell you, you know, if, if SCD thinks that it's healthy, um, again, this is one of the very first things that I usually run, because if I, if I suddenly see that this is not true, then I know something's wrong with that node. And I can start digging into that node and figure what's going on there. The other big one is logging. Um, SCD, as far as RKE and Rancher are concerned, they run in standalone pods. So you're not gonna see them from kubectl get pods. You'll only be able to see it via SSHing to the node. Um, some of the common errors, um, health check failing. This is usually when SCD is like crash looping on a node. You'll see that the other nodes are trying to connect to it and it's failing getting the you know, connection refused because it's not actually listening on the proper port. Um, you know, and again, these are just pointing to what the issue potentially could be. I'm not going to go through all these. Um, the other big one is firewall rules. Um, if everything's running fine and then suddenly um, all the nodes can't connect to each other, potentially a firewall or a networking issue. Um, we see this a lot with security groups that are really restrictive, um, where suddenly a node gets moved and then suddenly can't connect to any other nodes. Um, and then the, the other big one is the ID mismatch. So, and, and Patrick did a, a, a call yesterday um, talking about SCD, and this goes back to the concept of SCD data safety and protection are our number one priority. Um, so if SCD ever goes split brain, uh, one of the ways that it can detect that is by an ID number. In this case, one of the nodes thinks that it's now part of a new cluster and is trying to talk to them. So SCD is going, hey, something's clearly wrong. I don't know who's the right member, so I'm just going to stop. Um, and then that's when you would need to intervene and decide which is the correct member and, and run through the SCD restore procedure. Um, the other big one is um, SCD is stored in a directory on the box, um, 
far away with STD. Um, so one of the things is make sure, make sure you have free space in there. Um, STD is not usually not very big, um, but if, if one node suddenly runs out of space, in calls all sorts of kind of weird issues and start happening. Um, and then when in uh, when in doubt, don't be afraid. Um, as long as you have STD backup. If one node is acting up and the other two are fine, don't be afraid to remove it from the cluster, clean it, and rejoin it. Um, again, these are, are not pets, they're cattle, um, so let's treat them as such. Um, the other big one is debug logging. Um, so of course, this will be in the documentation as well. Um, the, the big note that I would put in here is never, ever, 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 ever leave debug logging turned on in production. Um, this does log a ton of information. It, I've, seen, I've seen it cause an outage because it's so much information because somebody left it on and basically filled up the log directory. Um, so of course, I, I generally only turn this on when absolutely necessary. I turn it on, reproduce the issue, and then I immediately turn it back to informational. Okay. Uh, next one. The other big one is metrics. Um, so generally, as long as STD is up, the other big issue that you're going to have with it is slowness. Um, again, you run this curl command. It's going to dump out a ton of data um, to you. But the big one that we want to worry about is this file sync and this back commit. Um, this is basically how long it takes STD to write its log to the disk. Again, SED is a data protection first um, database, so it doesn't use memory caching to, to do like, an, like a log intent like some other databases. Every write transaction is written to disk before it's knowledge, um, so we never lose a transaction. Um, hence why it's so sensitive to disk performance. Um, so these are, again, these are rough numbers, but Generally, I like to see under 10 milliseconds for GIF. Um, this usually means that you're going to be on SSD, uh, sun prem, probably tier one storage. Uh, it's not very much. Um, usually, you know, 10, 20 gigs is, is more than plenty. Um, but if you're seeing this really high, um, your cluster might be fine, but your STD is basically starving uh, for resources, and you're going to see slowness upstream because of that. Um, same thing with the back end commit. Um, and of course, you can, there's docs in the slides that go over a little bit more detail and have all these um, commands and scripts listed out. Um, the other big one is let's assume that STD is, is totally fine, it's passed all its health checks, it looks, it looks normal. Um, QBAPI is the number one customer to STD. Um, so the big thing that we want to check is can Cube API talk to all the STD nodes? Um, is there a firewall blocking it? Is there a routing issue? Um, so these two scripts right here uh, will go through and from all your control planes, you should be able to reach all of your STD nodes. Um, and what this script does is it just basically hits those test URLs to make sure that they can connect. The other big one is round trip times. Um, you'll see this if you're running like across regions or like on-prem to cloud or, or vice versa. Um, this is one of the reasons that that's not usually recommended is your round trip time between Cube API and STD, they really should be below 200 milliseconds. Now that's including network, that's including disk, that's including processing time. Um, so in, unless they're relatively close together, you can very easily get close to this number. Um, if you're seeing close to this number, it potentially is either Cube API is, is running out of resources, having resources exhaustion, or more likely it's STD is is not able to process that. Uh, and usually that comes down to CPU memory disk on STD are usually undersized um, and they need to be resized. The other big one is um, storage vMotion. Um, I've seen where 
if a key, a key baby I server suddenly gets moved by VMware, that suddenly this will skyrocket and start timing out and, and Keep API freaks out because it can't get to any of the STD nodes. Um, so it can cause those kind of weird issues in your environment. Um, the other big thing is your, your controller manager. Um, it works on the leader system. Um, so even though there's multiple pods of this running on as, as standalone containers on nodes, um, only one is ever active at a time. Um, so this just goes through to the endpoint and tells you which pod is currently active. Um, and again, you can, once you know which pod is, is active, you can then go in. And this is back to my earlier point with making sure that you have SSH access. You, sh you should be able to at least get um, SSH to all nodes, preferably MPD and control plane. Um, and it, it, even if you don't have root, set up your group so that you can look at these kind of logs. Because um, once you get to this point, it's, it's usually it's pretty clear and obvious what the issue is at that point. Um, you know, is this crash looping? What's going on with it? And same thing with Keep Scheduler. Um, again, this is the the workload that decides where pods go in, in your environment, um, and it works on the same exact mentality of that. There's multiple copies of this running, with only one that's actually master at any time. Um, any any one of them can take over the, the role of leader. Um, they basically are just all sit and stand by, um, just waiting to take over as soon as the leader goes down. Um, the other big one, and this is usually when you see a node is acting up, is Kubelet. Kubelet, think of it as the agent for the, the node as far as Kubernetes is concerned. Kubelet's down effectively that node is down as far as Kubernetes is concerned. It could still be up, it could still have apps running on it, it could be processing data, but as far as Kubernetes is concerned, that that's dead. Um, the big thing here is the stats. Um, there's ways of collecting this in QCPL, you just don't get all the stats. Um, so I generally will call this URL. It's gonna dump out a ton of information about your node. The big one is things like disk pressure. Um, you know, it, it's Kubernetes saying that, hey, you're running out of storage. Is it running out of memory? Um, is it running out of CPU? What's, what's going on? Um, and if this is sitting there crash looping, I generally recommend removing the node as quickly as possible because it causes inconsistencies. Because as far as Kubernetes is concerned, that node doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't know what's going on with those pods, so it won't reschedule those pods. Um, they just go into an unknown state, and then you're kind of locked out at that point until so you either get this back up and running or remove the nodes from the cluster. Um, and again, there's documentation on um, more around this, what you actually get in the stats. Um, the, and this goes back to my earlier point with most most of what you're going to be troubleshooting in Kubernetes is pod issues, um, where apps are crashing. You know, I deployed my app; it worked in non prod. Why isn't it working in prod? Um, so the big thing is to look at the state. Is it actually running? Um, you know, did they forget to create a secret, and so Kubernetes is going, "Hey, I can't schedule this because I'm missing resources." You know, or is it sitting there constantly restarting? Um, we, we see this a lot where people um, are missing configuration. The you know, app team forgot to connect to the database, so the app never comes online and it's just sitting there crash looping. Um, the other big one is the liveness and readiness probes. A um, little bit backstory readiness tells Kubernetes when the pod is ready to start serving traffic. So think of this as like, Okay, the pod started, it's healthy and ready to go. Liveliness simply says the pod's uh, running and it's, it's, it's still healthy. Um, I generally recommend trying to be very aggressive with these. Uh, you don't want to check your liveliness every five minutes um, because then your app could be down for five minutes and it's still sending traffic to it thinking that it's ready to go even though the, the app maybe crashed or something like that. Um, 
So I, I generally try to keep these very tight as possible. Uh, readiness, that's just that's how long it takes to start. I'm usually not too concerned on that. Um, the logging is the other big one. So one of the very first things I do is do a CPCL, get logs on a pod, and take a look at what's going on. Um, and you're, you're seeing live logs from that pod. Um, especially in the Ranger UI, you can actually view the previous pod too if it's sitting there crash looping. Um, and this is more of why isn't this working? You know, am I getting a Java error because it can't connect to a database? Am I forget a parameter so it's it's erroring out on that and immediately crashing? Um, the other big one is the event. Um, this is more around, let's say the pod can't even start because it's missing an image, it's missing storage, it's missing some kind of secret. This will tell you right away you know, what happened, why can this not, you know, and this could even be, I need 16 gigs of RAM, I can't find a node with that available resources, so I can't schedule it. Um, so, and as you can see here, like this one, um, the main thing to, to focus on is the, the type. If let's say this was an invalid, like I type out the image name wrong or something like that. Um, I would see, you know, failed to pull image, blah, 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 and it would give me the image tag. And Kubernetes will sit there and keep retrying it's essentially forever. It goes into what's called crash loop at that point. Um, one of the nice things that Kubernetes will do is if it keeps failing, it'll go into back off. So it'll sit there and wait. I believe it's, it's one minute, three minutes, five minutes, and then it just keeps going up from there. So one of the things is, is to monitor your environment for crash looping containers. If you're seeing this log and it's just crazy long and it's failing constantly, that's putting a load on your environment. Every time that that tries to start, it's calling Kubernetes, it's doing work, it's trying to start that up, and that's just putting a load on your environment. If you have hundreds of pods sitting there crash looping, you're going to have a bad day. That that's not normal, and, and nor nor should it be normal. Um, the other big one is, and this is something that kind of tripped me up at the beginning too, is Kubernetes and Rancher always add these tokens. They're, you can just ignore them as, as far as that's concerned. They're not real volume. Um, the other big one is the event. Um, so the big thing is on the described event was at a pod level. This is more at a, like a namespace level. So if you want to see a cost, like if we look here, it tried to pull this image, it got back an error um, because this is sitting there crash looping because I typed the, the, the wrong um, image name in here. Um, so, you know, going through and scanning these and saying, hey, I shouldn't see errors in here. Um, you know, it's crash looping. This is the, where I was talking about the crash loop back off where it, it failed to pull down the image because it didn't exist. And now it's, um, it'll, it'll retry again. It's going to sit there and keep retrying, um, you know, until the end of time. But that's just, it's putting a workload on your cluster. It's putting a workload on your, on your nodes. And it's even putting a workload on your artifact servers, such as um, GitHub. Um, I have seen customers get blacklisted by, you know, hub.docker.com because they have hundreds of, um, containers and crash loop trying to pull like a typoed image and it's just banging away at their servers and github will blacklist their IP for a period of time um, until they stop um, so try not to do that <laughs> that's a very bad day when you get blacklisted from that um, usually gets cleared up like after 15 minutes but um, this is very helpful and of course you can always scope this to a namespace um, always add the minus n command and scope it down to your namespace so you're not looking across the board. Or if you want, you can also do a dash dash on the spaces and look across your entire cluster. You're just gonna see a lot of events. Um, the other big one is the pending state. Um, you usually see this when um, a large deployment is done or a large cluster event happens. Um, 
if you run this and you see hundreds of pods sitting pending, that means that they're in the process of starting or they're waiting to be started, they're waiting to be scheduled, um, they're waiting on something. Um, the other big one is like a storage event. Um, so let's say that you're using an external storage provider, like NetApp, Pure Storage, EMC, you name them, um, and the storage guy just restarted it. Okay, well now all these pods are gonna sit there and wait on the, the resources and they'll sit there in a, in a not ready state because they're waiting on that volume to get mounted up. Um, the other big thing is usually after like, let's say you have like a power outage, um, you'll see that these, the, all your pods go unpending because it's sitting there they're trying to reschedule them. Um, it's fairly normal for it to take you know, five, 10 minutes to calm down, especially in very large environments. Um, what I would mostly want to look at is do these, to make sure that these pods actually come out of pending or are they just staying in, in pending state forever at that point? Because if they're stuck in pending, that's when you need to go back to your um, scribe and figure out what's going on. You know, is it missing an image? Is it missing a volume? Is it missing a secret? You know, what's what's going on or you know am i out of resources and it just can't deploy it somewhere um the other big one that i usually see is when people add nodes um sometimes and, and you know I'm, th this is my cluster and i'm even bad about it um if if one node is suddenly having issues one of the things that i'll look at is what's unique about that node um, in this case, I could see, well, hey, I'm running 18.04, and this node's running 15.04. If only these two nodes are having issues in my cluster, and the only thing special about it is my, you know, my kernel versions and my Ubuntu versions, maybe that's something I want to look at. It might not actually be the problem, but that's probably a really good place to start looking at issues. Um, you know, is this some package got deprecated and isn't working, or, you know, some bug in this version. Um, so I usually try to keep these all identical across your cluster. Um, there's always going to be reasons why you can't, um, but when in doubt, try to keep them the same or at least as close as, as you possibly can. Um, and then the other big one is your node conditions. Um, going back to Kubelet, Kubelet keeps track of what's going on in that node. Um, so it knows, you know, hey, this is how much memory I have, this is how much disk space I have. Um, and I believe it also does CPU too, but it's not on this list. Um, the big one is, is usually disk and memory. Um, if I'm exhausting my memory resources, such as let's say I have a developer that's deployed a 16 gig Java app, and my nodes are only, you know, 18 gigs. Yeah, it might, it might actually deploy to that. It might get on one node, but suddenly that node is going to start reporting memory pressure. Um, the default for almost all of these is 80%. Um, you can override them. I do not recommend it. Um, if you're running at 80% memory utilization, there's probably an issue in, in your node at that point. Um, mind you, this is based on both your used and you're allocated. Um, so if let's say you set reservations on all of your pods, um, your actual memory is just maybe next to nothing because it's not actually doing anything. But if somebody, say they typo a memory uh, request, and so instead of 16 gigs, they typed 160 gigs. And now suddenly 160 gigs of that node are called for at that, at that point. It might not be using it, but somebody has reserved 160 gigs on that node. Um, so you'll suddenly see disk pressure goes to true, uh, excuse me, memory pressure, sorry. Um, and then that, that tells you, hey, I need to look at this and see what's going on. You know, do I need to upsize my nodes? Do I need to, to reschedule pods? Um, one of the things is Kubernetes doesn't have a concept like VMware of moving work, workloads. It, it doesn't have a concept like vMotion or anything of that nature. Um, the really only way you can to force pods to move around is to basically delete them and let the scheduler recreate them. Um, 
it can be kind of a pain because it likes to keep them on the same note if, if it can. Um, so sometimes you have to kill them a couple of different times to get to actually kick over. Um, but generally, this this is something in, in ranchers monitoring is pretty good about monitoring all these. Um, that's what you'll see in the dashboard is if any of these go into the tree because you're ready, um, you're going to get an alert in Rancher. It's going to say, hey, you need to look at this um, and say, you know, what, what's going on here? Um, the other big one is your firewall um, and networking. Um, so we, of course, have a, a, a great document that, that covers all the ports that need to be opened. Um, when in doubt, if if you're standing up a cluster for the first time, um, I, I I would send this document over to your your networking or firewall team um, because you can get all sorts of kind of weird behavior if let's say only one of the FTD nodes has this firewall but the other one doesn't. It might actually come up at first, but then suddenly when that node goes down, it now it can't connect to the other one. Um, so. When, and especially in a lot of cloud providers, generally I add all nodes to the, the same security groups just so that they can they talk to each other. Um, the other one is MTU size, um, especially lately. Um, if you have jumbo frames, try to match them across all nodes. Don't try to mix match ma match nodes. Um, and this goes back to my earlier point about. Um, if you're crossing, let's say you have some of your nodes on-prem and some in the cloud, you're going to have a fun time matching those MTU sizes so that it's not getting fragmented, um, especially with FTD in the control plane. They don't like to change MTU sizes between the two, um, so that can cause all sorts of kind of weird issues with that. And then the other big one that we see a lot is DNS. Um, this usually comes up with a little backstory on how um, core DNS or cube DNS works. Is it's it's just a bind server um, as far as cube DNS is concerned. Um, core DNS is just a, a, a go version of bind in, in a nutshell. Um, so it's just it's it's relaying DNS to an upstream provider um, and then it's injecting its own DNS in there too. So internal DNS works. We see this a lot where the cluster gets set up, you point it to, let's say, a domain controller, and then a year later, the Windows guys get rid of that domain controller and suddenly DNS stops working. Um, so anytime you're seeing DNS issues, um, I always spin up a busy box. Um, Kubernetes default should always just work. Um, and then, you know, the, the classic, you know, look up Google, okay, I can if I can ping uh, I can look up Kubernetes default. Okay, that tells me that my internal is working. But if suddenly I can't get to Google, okay, what's going on here? You know, is, is it my upstream servers have changed? Um, RK and Rancher get their upstream servers based upon the node. So whatever FD resolve is on the node, that's what it assumes the upstream. Um, if that's not right, there is ways to override that in your cluster.yaml file. Um, but generally, what I tell people is stick to, um, you know, preferably have those as part of like a, a load balancer or something like that to make it as highly available as possible. Um, one of the things with core DNS and cube DNS is it doesn't do a lot of caching. Um, so y your upstream DNS servers do get hit, hit quite, a, quite frequently. Um, and that's just simply for the fact that we don't want to cache a lot. A record. So, you know, what happens when you fail a database over an updated a, a record? Do you want that to be cached in Kubernetes? Well, not really. You want it to be as quick down as possible. Um, I do have scripts for going out there and interrogating your DNS. Um, so, one of the things is even if your core DNS or cube DNS are up and running and responding, um, we have seen issues with. In short term, well, then lying through their teeth. So you'll look, do an NS lookup against Google, and the port's up and it's responding, but you may not get back an address. It'll just it'll return like a null address or it'll return, it, return an invalid address. Um, 
we we've seen that happen, especially with like NCU sizes being weird and stuff like that. Um, so this script in in particular actually goes out there and requests certain records, and it makes sure that it gets not only a response but the correct response. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. The other big one is ingress. Um, so long story short. The load balancer um, that Rancher uses by default, at least today, is Nginx. Um, it's effectively just plain old Nginx that we add some extra stuff on top to make it work in the Kubernetes world. Um, but basically how it works is you have Kubeproxy that runs on um, all your worker nodes. That forwards traffic in a, think of it like a layer four TCP forward to one of the ingress uh, controllers. These are basically just running Nginx. Um, if you know Nginx, you can actually just hop into these containers. Actually, let me do my next slide. Uh, no, that's not the right one. Um, but it, it's, ju it's just a generic Nginx config. You can open that config up. You can take a look at it. Um, you can't modify it on the fly. Um, simply for the fact that basically what we're doing is we're just constantly reloading that whenever anything changes the environment. Um, and most of the time what that is is pods are changing. So if you actually look in this config, you'll see, you know, blah, 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 front end, and it's pointing to this back end with these pods in them. And of course, I have a script to go out there and interrogate the Nginx config and basically query all of the back end members well, a lot of times what we see is, let's say, one worker node is having networking issues. And so you'll get traffic that comes in here. As far as Nginx is concerned, you know, pod one might be totally fine. Um, but pod two and three are having networking issues. So Nginx is still forwarding traffic to those two bad nodes, even though, you know, and, and you'll still get intermittent, like, you know, oh, suddenly I get 502 because I'm getting timeouts. Um, and that's, that's usually because um, somebody creates an invalid load balancer. Um, so Kubernetes will totally let you uh, create, like, you know, so you create two different rules, but with the same host name, it will totally let you do that. Um, so be careful with it. Um, the big thing is, is this is also a cluster level. Um, so everybody in the cluster is sharing those load balancers. Um, so, you know, it, it, you can't just do like a star. Um, I try to avoid, you know, big, um, I was gonna say, like wild card records and wild card rules that just kind of stomp over everybody else because suddenly you break somebody else's application um, for that. And there's Istio and, and, and Rio that do this a lot better, um, but, you know, Nginx is just the default today. Um, and I, of course, encourage you to look at the documentation that goes a lot deeper into this. Uh, yeah. So the other big one is um, response time. So one of the things with Nginx especially is generally your configuration will be you have um, worker nodes where Nginx is running, and then you'll have usually like a load balancer in front of that, you know, like an F5, A10, you know, you name it, even Nginx in front of it, um, forwarding traffic to the different worker nodes. Um, one of the big things is, if let's say that's running on a, a generic worker, what happens when that worker becomes overwhelmed? Suddenly, Nginx is still running on it, still responding, but it starts timing out. And so the front end load balancer starts, you know, punting workloads and, and shifting traffic to other nodes. Well, now suddenly that 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 node is having issues, and so one of the things that I generally will look at is, you know, what's my response time? Uh, you know, is this acceptable? Do I need to maybe tweak my response time on my front end load balancer to handle that, or do I need to upsize? The other big thing that I usually recommend is to dedicate workers to the load balancer role, especially when you have tons and tons of applications with all their own ingresses and um, it sometimes just makes more sense to dedicate nodes to that role 
Um, it also helps with things like node pools and availability groups where workers can go in and out and their IP address to change. And then, okay, now do I have to go to the little downstream console and keep updating those? Um, all right, let's see, next one. It is. The other thing is, so the ingress. Um, again, back to my previous point, it's just Nginx. So if you want, you can just, um, you can just go in and, and cat that file and take a look at the config. Um, it's pretty long, so a lot of times I'll do it from the command line and um, actually get the config and then put it in Notepad++ or something like that to kind of read through it. Um, you know, search for your, your your host header. Okay, that's my rule. What's going on? And you know, list out my backend app. Um, you know, do I have multiple of the same host header will define in my config. Um, the other big one is, and this doesn't happen very often anymore, but it used to happen a lot, where one node will start getting these, what I would call a scale config. Um, so one of your controllers is suddenly behind the other one, and it's usually because there's a, an issue on that node. Um, you know, keyblade or key proxy is it's crashing on that node or something like that. Um, so checking your config, um, you know, just doing a simple MD5 hash of each of your uh, load balancers. By default, we always do three. Um, those configs should be identical. They they should be almost lockstep with each other. There's there's it might be a few milliseconds where they're slightly out of sync, but for the most part, they're they're lockstep with each other. And then the other one um, is debugging. Um, so we tend to turn this on a lot when applications are getting weird, you know, 502s and, and 500 responses, and you, you're getting the 502 response, but your application's not throwing it. Um, you know, is, okay, is it my load balancer that's having the issue, or is it my application? Um, so one of the things that you can add, and you can add this to almost all Kubernetes services, is the the v2 and or v5 um, i generally don't recommend v5 just because of the amount of data that it produces um, it produces a ton of data again do not leave this on in production um, but you can of course edit this on the fly um, you basically just you're, you're telling nginx to give you more debug information um, and generally what i'll do is i'll turn it on reproduce the issue and then immediately turn it back on and then I'll usually pull, um, use this first command to get the logs across all pods and pipe that to a file and then start digging through that file. And then if you trace where is it having the issue, is it because my application is timing out on the back end? Okay, well, why is that timing out? Um, I believe curl is available in the, in the newer versions of the Nginx pod. Um, so that's another big thing that you can do is, is just simply log in and, Open a shell to that load balancer and try to curl your backend application. You know, is, is, you know, if, if that doesn't work, okay, well, then clearly my issue is between my load balancer and my app. You know, okay, that's when then that's when you go back to networking. Okay, does it work on the app? Okay, clearly it's an overlay network, or no, it doesn't even work on the app. You know, is it because I mistyped a port or something like that? And then the other big thing, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, is recommendations. If you are running any kind of mission critical production cluster, if you, I, I, I wholeheartedly, and, and you could smack me with a stick, but I'm going to say it to the, to the end of the day, have a lab environment. You need a sandbox. You, you need an environment where you can break it. You can kill a node, you can go in and fill up the root file system, you can test upgrades, you can test scripts. I mean, it, it, it is, so you will get so much benefit that it will pay for it, 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 its cost in resources tenfold. Um, and this doesn't have to be big. Three nodes, two cores, four gigs of RAM per node, and you're done. Um, you know, just having a small test and, and lab environment that, not a test for your application, but a test for your Kubernetes rancher infrastructure team to test again. So they can, you know, 
<laughs> so they, they can test their, their application. Um, don't assume. Um, one of the big things is, I don't know how many calls I've been on where, oh yeah, we, we didn't make any changes. And then at the end of the call, we realized, oh, the firewall team just upgraded the router and, you know, failed over last night. And that suddenly caused an issue. Don't be afraid to interrogate your infrastructure teams and say, hey, did you do anything? Even if it's totally normal for them to do, interrogate them, get the answers. Um, the other thing is, make your life a little easy. Um, label your nodes, give them intelligent names. Um, you know, worker one, okay, that's great. Is this production? Is this located in AWS? Is this, is, you know, where is this box at? You know, so in, in the often you can work with your infrastructure teams. Lots of times they already have naming standards. Make them intelligently labeled. You know, 3 a.m. Matthew is not the smartest Matthew. So I want those to be as labeled as clear as possible. And, you know, make sure that your production labels look different than your non-production labels. Uh, when in doubt, add labels. It, it's never going to hurt you to have extra labels. You know, like putting a label of, this is a physical box. This is running in AWS. You know, um, you know when in doubt, add labels. Um, it's, you're, you're never going to get in trouble for having it too labeled. Um, the other big thing is your debug and recovery process. And this goes back to the earlier point of having a lab environment. Uh, 3 a.m. Matthew doing your restore for the very first time is not a good idea. I would much rather do that restore in a lab environment you know, two weeks ahead before that outage where I've gone through it, I've learned all my lessons, I've learned, okay, I need to open a ticket with this team to get access and I need keys for this and here's my procedure and I've written it all down so that when it does come time, I can just give 3 a.m. Matthew that doc and say, follow this. Um, or, you know, give my own call guy that doesn't really know Kubernetes, but he can follow a doc. Um, so get comfortable with that and don't be afraid to break that environment. Um, you know, and potentially do this, do something stupid, power off a node, and then walk through the procedures of how do you recover that node, um, you know, and, and do it when you have time and not, not when the executive is sitting under your desk yelling and get it back up. Um, know your, your environment. Um, know how many pods are running in your environment. If you normally run 500 pods, and then your application team, unbeknownst to you, deploys 2,000 pods to a cluster. And then the next day, you get a, a sub one ticket of, hey, everything's running slow. You know, if you didn't know that you only run 500 pods, how do you know that suddenly that's changed? Uh, so know, know your baselines, know what what's good in your environment. Um, and again, this goes back to having lower environments that you can test against. If you say, listen, I'm I'm running you're running 10x the production, but you're the same size as, as your QA cluster. Okay, we need to look at resizing this, or, or maybe it's vice versa. It's fairly common for lower environments to be bigger than the production environment. Um, the other one is central logging. I don't know how many times having Splunk or Elf or LogZ or you name it, having a log tool that gathers logs across your nodes, across your apps, across your cluster, across clusters. Um, having that in one repository that's easily searchable makes troubleshooting infinitely faster at that point. Um, same thing with metrics. Um, you know, we have Prometheus built in. Um, it's, it's a great tool, but it doesn't do like across clusters. Um, the big one is, is logging. Hey, Matthew, uh, we're actually uh, running a little short on time. Do you have a few minutes for a couple questions? Yep, um, just two other things. Document, sure. take backup, test your backup. If you don't do these two steps, you're gonna have a bad day. And, and, <laughs> and make sure you get it done. All right, um, and then resources. Yep, all right, so I'm ready for questions. All right, so uh, first question from Matthias. Um, he says, Recently, we've had uh, AS, uh, an issue that a node was overfilled, and in a case of a spike, it locked up that caused the cluster instability. 
What is the standard scheduling pro approach? As far as I know, Kubernetes doesn't know about the node load and schedules randomly. What approach should one take to prevent the cluster instability and or node lockup? So what I would recommend on that front is to look into setting uh, resource limits and resource, uh, resource requests. Um, long story short, limit is, is how much resources that pod's allowed to use. Request is please reserve this amount of resources. If you set those properly, especially for very large applications, um, you're, you're telling Cube Scheduler what this workload looks like, so please do it intelligently. If you don't tell it, Kubernetes just tries its best. It's not always you know, intelligent with its decisions. Um, so I, I generally, especially with like Java and database applications, set, set your CPU and memory, um, re request and limit, um, and you, of course, sit there and you have to work with your app teams to tune those as well. And a second question from Ramesh. He says, do we need to enable Nginx tracing? Um, if you're debugging an issue, yes. Um, I generally try to avoid that. Uh, it goes back to my earlier point is the Nginx ingress is across the cluster. So let's say you have 200 applications. Imagine the amount of logs that are going to come from tracing all 200 applications at the same time. You, you, you potentially could run into other problems that are not your original problem. Um, I, I generally would only do that if you know engineering requested it, um, and then preferably try to reproduce it in your lower environment first and do it there where you're not going to break the world. Um, but yeah. And finally, we have, uh, actually, we have two more questions. I think we might have enough time. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nabil. He asks, how do you troubleshoot plague problems? So um, plagues always point to an, a networking issue. Um, that's something, you know, canal, flannel, whatever network provider you're using is having some issues. Like what, it, what it's saying is, is, I can't get a MAC address or I can't get an IP address. And, and the guy that hands that out is your network provider. Um, so I would dig into your canal, flannel, weave, whatever network provider you're using. And usually, as soon as you look at those logs, it'll, it'll tell you pretty quickly what's going on there. Okay, and we have a couple more um, from... Harlan, uh, he asks, what is better to use, small nodes or large nodes for EKS? And I, I think this could also apply for pretty much all kinds of Kubernetes clusters in general. I think for his specific question that he was asking about EKS. Yeah, um, so I'm going to say EKS and in, in, in generic clusters are, are the same as far as my recommendation. Um, etcd scale up, not horizontally. Don't go above five nodes, preferably three nodes. Uh, controllers, they generally don't need to be too big. Your worker nodes, um, when in doubt, try to scale horizontally um, until that doesn't make sense. If you have a 32 gig Java application, you're going to have to scale up. Um, it usually makes more sense to scale horizontally than vertically, um, just for the simple fact that it's easier to, to just add nodes versus sizing up nodes. Um, one of the other big things that I usually recommend is don't be afraid to mix and match. Um, it's okay to have some nodes that are, you know, full core by 16, but then you have, you know, let's say you set a label and say this is a CPU node, so it's got 64 cores available to it. Um, and, and use your labels and node selector rules to um, decide where what workloads do to run where. Um, I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Um, sorry, we, we do have a few more questions. Uh, some of these I will go ahead and ask in uh, chat, but in the meantime, we'll go ahead and ask the next one. Um, let's see here. Uh, the the next question comes from, uh, and I'm sorry, I may pronounce your name incorrectly, uh, Pierre. Eves or Piri Eves, he says, uh, should AKS with Rancher uh, be used? Uh, I fear not having enough debugging info um, when having issues with their config. 
Yeah. Um. So this is more of, do you trust any of the other insert letter of alphabet KS? Um, generally, I don't. I don't like those kind of clusters because you're the cloud provider is managing that cluster for you. Um, so for every example, um, EKS backups are kind of crippled because Amazon's managing them for you. Um, if Amazon decides to push an update, guess what? There's no telling them not to. Um, Rancher, and, and again, this is you know, taking my Rancher head off and talking as a former customer, Rancher kind of just managed things a lot better, um, especially with node pools and node templates and RKA templates. We made it really easy to where it's just not required to run EKS. You know, because you run EKS if you don't want to manage the cluster. Well, it's easier to just let Rancher manage the cluster for you. Um, but again, there's 500 different ways to, to cut this cake. And um, I, we, we've worked with Azure and AWS to debug issues. And of course, they have access to do a lot of that. Um, you just have to work with their support. You don't get a lot of the, those city logs and everything available to you. All right, and uh, it looks like that's it for our questions today. Uh, just just for those of you that have asked and may not have seen my reply earlier, uh, we will be sending out a an email after the presentation with the link to this video and also a, a copy of the Kubernetes uh, troubleshooting PowerPoint slides. Uh, I understand that their um, the email for yesterday's presentation has not been sent out, so uh, if um, or at least some people have not received it, so I will be in the Slack masterclass chat room. So if you guys uh, are looking for that email, you can go ahead and ping me in that chat, and I'll send you an email, uh, at least a reply to let you know once it's been sent out. So if you miss the email, I can um, forward you a copy or you know paste it in the channel for you. Um, cool. And uh, Matthew, were there any other uh, things you would like to um, say before we uh, um, conclude our presentation? Yeah, I, I'll just be in the, in the same channel. If you've got questions, um, please, please, please ask. Um, use, use our Rancher form. Even if you're not a Rancher customer, we're, we're always in those forms answering questions and, and helping debug issues. And when in doubt, if you see a bug, please open a bug ticket against us so we can fix it. And uh, I'd just like to add to that, um, if, if you are not on our Slack uh, right now, you can go to http uh, colon forward slash forward slash slack dot rancher dot io and uh, it'll prompt you to put in your email address. You can click on get my invite and that will send you an email with a link that will allow you to join our um, Slack server. And I'll also go ahead and send that out in a question answer to the people that asked that, so they have that in a text reply as well. All right, thank you guys, and uh, have a good rest of your day.